Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second quarter fiscal year 2020 earnings call. We have with us a Chief Executive Officer Rono Datta and a Chief Financial Officer Aditya Pandey to take you through our performance for the quarter. Wolfgang Frockshauer, a Chief Operating Officer, and Willy Bolter, a Chief Commercial Officer, are also with us and are available for the Q&A session. Before we begin, please note that today's discussion may contain certain statements on the business of financials, which may be construed as forward-looking. Our actual results may be materially different from these forward-looking statements. The information provided on this call is as of today's date, and we undertake no obligation to update the information subsequently. A transcript of today's call will also be archived on our website. We will upload the transcript of today's prepared remarks within an hour. The transcript of the Q&A session will be uploaded subsequently. With this, let me hand over the call to Ronald. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this call. We reported a net loss of 10.6 billion rupees in a seasonally weak quarter for the industry. While we had a much better revenue performance during the quarter, the loss was driven by certain cost headwinds. These costs fall into three major categories. Number one, mark-to-market loss due to capitalization of operating lease liabilities. Two, reassessment of accrual estimates for future maintenance costs. And three, one-time adjustment owing to adop- adoption of lower tax rates. Let me stress that each of these cost items is non-cash in nature and does not reflect on the cash flows we generate. Excluding the impact of these cost items, our loss before tax would have been 2.8 billion rupees, a significant improvement over the 9.9 billion rupees we posted in the same period last year. Over the half year ended September 2019, Post-servicing our debt and lease obligations, we have generated a very healthy cash flow of 33 billion rupees through our operating activities, which clearly demonstrates the strength of our business and our company. And our company, our CFO Aditya Pandey will go into detail on each of these items. Now, let me speak to the fundamental operating metrics of the quarter. We continue to see a year-over-year improvement in unit revenues. And this quarter, we reported a 5.7% increase. Our rapid expansion into both domestic and international markets has been very impressive. We opened seven new domestic stations and six new international markets. Frankly, I am personally staggered by what Indigo employees have been able to achieve in this regard. When I set a target for the opening of two China stations, two Vietnam stations, one Myanmar station, one Saudi Arabia station. Plus 35 additional vacancies into international markets, I was hesitant as to whether I was demanding too much from the organization. Think of all that it takes to operate into a new country or even to add a new frequency. There are the regulatory hurdles, slots at airports, crew familiarization flights, ground handling contracts, sales agreements, PR initiatives, and much more. The fact that Indigo employees were able to achieve over 100% in so compressed national market in so compressed a time period, I think, is a real testimony to the quality of this organization. Cargo has maintained its rapid growth during the quarter in both domestic and international sectors. As per the DGC reports, we now have a 39% market share in the domestic cargo business, a significant increase from the 28% we had in the same period last year. Our international cargo capacity has grown by more than 80% on a year-over-year basis. We are now also focusing on inbound cargo business from Southeast Asia and Middle East, and I'm very pleased with the response we're getting on these sectors. During the quarter, Indigo was awarded the best domestic airline at FICCI's first edition of Travel and Tourism Excellence Awards. These awards motivate all of us at Indigo to keep pushing the bar and set higher standards. We are putting a lot of emphasis on improving our service standards. There are two avenues that we use to identify and track areas of improvement. The first avenue is customer feedback, on which we spend a lot of management time and attention in analyzing and identifying root causes. The second avenue is the Net Promoter Score, which organizations around the world are using. I am pleased to say that our NPS scores compare favorably with most of the low-cost carriers around the world. Now, looking forward to the next quarter, the revenues during the festive season have been somewhat subdued. At this time, we are expecting a flattish year-over-year unit revenue performance. Please note that it's still early in the quarter, and things will, of course, change 
and we take no responsibility to further update our revenue forecast before the next earnings release. We are seeing declines in yield in metro-to-metro markets where low-cost capacity has replaced former jet airways capacity. We are seeing stronger performance in markets where jet was not previously present. On international markets, despite a significant increase in capacity, our unit revenues are holding up rather well, with China in particular performing well ahead of plan. On our capacity guidance, we expect a year-over-year capacity increase in terms of ASKs of 22% for the third quarter of this fiscal year. For the full year, we expect capacity increase of 25%. As you are well aware, Aditya Pandey has joined us as a new Chief Financial Officer. Aditya has vast experience spanning across more than two decades in several blue-chip organizations, and we are excited to have Aditya as part of the team. Now let me hand over the call to Aditya to discuss the financial performance in detail. Thank you, Rono, and uh, good evening, everyone. For the quarter ended in September 2019, we reported a net loss of 10.6 billion rupees, with a negative after-tax profit margin of 13.1%, compared to a net loss of 6.5 billion rupees, with a negative tax, after-tax margin of 10.5% during the same period last year. We reported an EBITDA of 2.6 billion rupees, with an EBITDA margin of 3.2%, compared to an EBITDA of 2.2 billion rupees with an EBITDA margin of 3.6% during the same period last year. As Rono mentioned, the lower profitability was mainly contributed by mark-to-market loss due to capitalization of operating lease liabilities, reassessment of accrual estimates for future maintenance costs, and one-time adjustment owing to adoption of lower tax rates. Let me discuss each one of these three factors in detail. As you would know that we have capitalized the operating lease liabilities as per the new accounting standard in the S116. These liabilities are dollar denominated, and hence they are subject to mark to market every quarter. Since during the quarter, rupee depreciated from 68.90 rupees per US dollar to 70.71 rupees per US dollar, we had a negative impact of 4.3 billion rupees on mark to market of our capitalized operating leases. If you recall, we have mentioned previously that we are experiencing a maintenance bubble because of CEO engines. We, we extended the lease of most of our existing CEO beginning 2016 and also got around 50 used aircraft from the secondary market. As a result of this, the engines of these older aircraft are undergoing second shop visits, which are significantly more expensive than the first shop visits. These second shop visits resulted in maintenance spikes in our cost. During the quarter, we have carried out the reassessment of accrual estimates for heavy maintenance and overall cost of engines. Accordingly, we provided 3.2 billion rupees under supplementary rentals and aircraft maintenance costs. This reassessment is confined to our older CEO aircraft. This cost should continue to be in a similar range for the next couple of quarters. This maintenance cost should eventually go away around 2022 as the NEOs become a larger portion of our fleet and these older CEO planes are redelivered. The government has announced an option for corporates wherein tax rate is reduced from 35% to 25.2%, a tax reduction of 9.8%. In addition, the companies adopting the same will not be required to pay minimum alternate tax on MAT going forward. We have decided to adopt the new t- lower tax rates. This lower tax, this, lo- this will lower our effective tax rate, and we will no longer be required to pay MAT, which will result in lower cash tax outcome. The key highlights of our performance during the quarter can be best summarized by the following points. Our capacity grew by 24.2% on a year-over-year basis. Our revenue from operations in, sub- in September quarter was 81.1 billion rupees, an increase of 31% on a year-over-year basis. Our RAS for the quarter was 3.42 rupees compared to 3.23 rupees during the same period last year, an increase of 5.7%. For the quarter, our yields increased by 9.4% to 3.52 rupees, while the load factors were down by 0.9 points to 83.5%. Our fuel cash decreased by 17.3% compared to 8.7% decrease in ATF prices on a year-over-year basis. Fuel was a very good story for us. We are seeing a much faster decrease in fuel cash compared to decrease in fuel prices, primarily driven by fuel savings from the new aircraft. Further, our international operations has also helped us to reduce our fuel costs, both because of lower taxes and higher stage length. We have also taken a number of operational initiatives, which has contributed to a lower fuel cask number. Our cask for the quarter was 3.85 rupees compared to 3.74 rupees during the same period last year, an increase of 2.8%. Our cask X fuel was 2.56 rupees, an increase of 17.2% from the same period last year. Excluding the impact of mark-to-market loss, uncapitalized operating lease and reassessment of accrual estimates of future maintenance costs, our cash ex-fuel would have increased 3.1%. 
This cash increase was primarily driven by higher employee costs and lower aircraft utilization. While we have little control over the depreciation of the Indian rupee, we definitely see some areas of improvement in our cash ex fuel in the coming quarters. For the quarter, our employee costs were higher by 56% compared to the same period last year. As stated during the previous conference call as well, the higher employee cost is because of around 600 pilots being under training in sourcing of ground handling at most of our domestic airports through our wholly owned subsidiary Agile Airport Services Private Limited salary hikes. We expect the impact of these pilots under training to be negative 2.3% on our cash ex fuel. We expect the employee cost per ass to start going down from the second half of the year, second of the year onwards as these pilots complete their training and start flying. Secondly, similar to previous quarter, we continue to hold certain aircraft in reserve awaiting clarity on allocation of jet airway slots. As a result, our aircraft utilization was lower by around 9% compared to the same period last year. We estimate that lowered aircraft utilization contributed to contributed to 2.7% <coughs> in the increase of gas. Let me take over for, while he clears his throat for a minute. Um, so let me start again on the last sentence. We estimate that lower aircraft utilization contributed to 2.7% in the increase of cask X fuel. We expect the aircraft utilization to increase and translate into better cask X fuel performance. Our balance sheet continues to remain strong. Our cash balance at the end of the period was 187 billion rupees, comprised of 87 billion rupees of free cash and 100 billion rupees of restricted cash. The capitalized lease liability as of 30th September 2019 was 175 billion rupees. Our total debt, including the capitalized lease liability, was 198 billion rupees. And with that, let me hand it back to Ankur. Thank you, Ronan and Aditya. To answer as many questions as possible, I would like to request that each participant limit themselves to one question and one brief follow-up question if needed. And with that, we are ready for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the attached own phone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Divika Mundra from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, the first question is regarding the ASK growth guidance. Uh, it's c considerably lower as to what you had guided to earlier. Um, is this because of aircraft uh, delivery issues, or um, is it just that because of a weak, uh, weak environment you are postponing uh, deliveries? No, I, but it's not because of the weak environment. So um, looking backwards, the reason why we were softer in terms of ASK growth, as I said, is because of the jet slot issues. So this is affecting sort of September, August and September. When we knew that we would get uh, various landing rights and slots and bilaterals, but they all kept getting delayed. So the aircraft were waiting for, okay, okay, next week we'll get it, and it didn't happen. So that was looking backwards why we were soft. Looking forward, though, uh, the softness is because of aircraft delivery issues. Uh, could you just elaborate as to what is the uh, delivery issue? Um, so uh, I'll let Wolfgang Proksha take that. Yeah, hello. So basically our delivery stream, and this was planned for the next, uh, for the next year, uh, is that uh, the growth rate is coming down anyhow because uh, we used to get something like six aircraft per month. Now this, this growth rate is expected to come down. This is one element. And also we have certain delays in our aircraft deliveries coming, which may be in the range of three to four months. So that also reflects and uh, uh, depresses a bit the, our, our growth going forward for the next year. So these are the main elements of it. But it doesn't change our fundamental growth strategy going forward. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vinay Singh from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, team. Uh, just uh, actually uh, continuing on the earlier question. So uh, what sort of a growth are you looking next year in ASKM? Mm, by next year, you mean the, uh, okay, the following year. I don't have the number. It will be around 25% roughly. Okay. 
just uh, one question like on supplementary rentals or repairs and maintenance we've seen that number move up quite sizably from 10 billion to 15 billion and in your remarks you mentioned that uh, around 3.2 billion is basically uh, uh, sort of a charge for uh, the older engines so a uh, this 3.2 billion number so in a way are you saying that this 3.2 billion number will continue in the coming quarter so the supplementary rentals and repairs and maintenance um, as a percentage of ASK will remain at these levels yeah, so we we expect uh, this is Aditya. We expect the supplementary re rentals to remain at similar levels for uh, the next quarter and the quarter after. And that's as, as I said earlier, that's primarily because of the uh, second shop visits that we're seeing on these older CEO aircrafts that we have. And I think we also mentioned uh, we return a bunch of these uh, CEO aircraft by 2022. So after that, this uh, engine maintenance cost will show a decline. And the 33 billion number that you shared on cash flow, uh, is that your operating cash flow for uh, like this quarter? Or like what, what was that 33 billion number earlier in the opening remark? It's on a six monthly basis. This is for the half year. So that, that is your cash profit on six monthly basis. Okay, great. Uh, yes. Thanks. I'll come back in the queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anshumandim from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I just wanted a uh, little bit more clarification on this uh, maintenance cost. So, uh, FY20, uh, remaining two quarters, we have will have this elevated supplementary cost, and FY21, we will have a run rate, which is uh, lower than this. And then on FY22, we would have a more new fleet, which should kind of not give the supplementary rental. Is this the right understanding? Yeah, that's that's directionally the the correct understanding. It is in in the, for the current year we continue to be will remain in 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 a similar range. Twenty one that number should start reducing and starting twenty two as the CEOs CEOs actually start retiring uh, starting next year. But as they start going out in higher volume in twenty two, these numbers will start coming down. So when we are providing for this uh, number, are we uh, are are we paying the supplementary rental on a on a shop visit basis or we are providing it upfront? Yeah, so we provide it in our books, and we pay it. We pay it once uh, once the engine visits the shop, and we and and we get the bill from the MRO uh, in terms of you know what what that particular cost is for that. But these maintenance costs are you talking about heavy maintenance? Okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ajal Kumar from HSBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, so um, I want to understand a few things. One. Um, is about your stand on um, Air India international operations. Previously, you said that you're still interested in international operations if it comes. So what is your stand on that? And when we talk about Air India s separately, you also said that you are interested in white body. So where are you on that? If you could please clarify on this. Um, those are all great questions to which we do not have definitive answers. They are all uh, subject matter of great interest. So we talk about it in various management forums, and we do not have uh, uh, something to declare or announce, either yes or no. Um, we recognize that uh, we are at a point of our evolution where we have to think of longer-range aircraft. Um, but beyond that, really, I don't have much to share at this point. Um, okay, um, fine. Uh, then uh, other thing I wanted to understand um, very quickly on this maintenance cost, which you said, um, uh, 3.2 billion, is that um, would that be impacted by the Forex? I mean, so the Forex will definitely, so is it, is it paid in USD and then definitely it will be impacted by Forex. Is that correct? So, so we, we have provided we have provided for those, uh, you know, in, in our books, and obviously these bills are raised in foreign exchange, but it's no different than, it's been done in the past. I mean, in the past, we have always operated on the principle that we pay the bill as we get it from the MRO. So it's, it's always a dollar-denominated dollar bill. It will continue to be a dollar-denominated bill. So that will have an impact from the Forex, right? Yes, 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 it would. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, last two questions. One is on the on the engine side. So recently, I think DGCA has, now, he has said, disclosed something, you know, that you cannot fly a few particular engines. Um, after, a, after a specific time period, so how that will impact um, Indigo. And secondly, on the on the international operations, you said that your international operations are doing great, especially China. So I just want to understand overall as a unit, as an international operations, how you're doing. And why I'm asking is because 
I was traveling in one of your flights in Calcutta, Hong Kong, and I saw just 30 passengers on board, 2030. So, um, and then you discontinued this flight probably because of tensions in, in Hong Kong. So overall, I wanted to understand, um, is that particular case with Hong Kong or how you're experiencing overall international exp um, operations? Thank you. So I'll address the international issue, and then Wolfgang will pick up on the engine issue. So international, uh, you're right. Well, Hong Kong was doing badly. I guess it was doing badly for everyone with all the unrest there. So we have discontinued it. Internationally, we're very pleased with the results. Um, and, you know, international is on a different, uh, somewhat different cycle seasonally to domestic, so it has its own swings up and down. But the Middle East is very strong. As I said, China is strong. Uh, Hong Kong is an area of weakness, and we started some flights, unfortunately, uh, not by choice, but by necessity, with a very short time window, and I'm thinking of places like um, Vietnam and so forth. Uh, we had to start, it took us a long time to get all the approvals, which I talked about before, the regulatory hurdles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and we had a certain date. We had to start by October, given the fact that uh, after that, uh, there's a whole new slot season, as you know. So some of those international markets with very short time windows for booking, uh, you know, international typically has a 90-day booking window, and we were starting flights with like a 30 to 45 days booking window. Some of the flights didn't get the full benefit of the booking, but overall we're very pleased with the international uh, profitability. And with that, I'll give it to Wolfgang. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on, the, on the engine, um, we can see overall improve, significant improvement in trend. For example, in the key, the, the key uh, uh, event is natural infra shutdown. This rate has come down to 0 0.01 per thousand engine flight hours, so very low. And just to put it in perspective, the regulatory requirements in FAA, for example, or in uh, EASA is uh, 0 0.05, so five times as high. So we are well within the regulatory limits of the required, let's say, efficiency and, uh, and reliability of the engine. And basically, most of the Many of the uh, of the issues have been fixed. There are three main issues uh, uh, remaining, which we are very are still um, very on good track. One is the third stage low pressure turbine, where uh, all Indigo's air, all our aircraft are delivered from May 2019 onwards with a new material. So and there is no time limit for us. So all aircraft will be de will be delivered, and uh, we have time to, to change all these um, plates with new material. Main gearbox. It is fixed. There was a, a required um, software change, which is done already. And the last element of the, the, the number three is the transient vibration, which is a, in the nature of this engine, which happens. And um, all regulatory uh, uh, authorities outside India have, uh, there is a, a requirement. If it's below a certain threshold, there's no maintenance activity required. We, however, have taken a more cautious approach and uh, uh, we're fulfilling that. So there's no, what I hear, I've heard from your question is that there might be some limits we're having. We continue with all our deliveries. We have no limitations. However, there's one limitation I want to mention, extended range operations, where you have an airport outside. Right now we operate, every airport must be reachable on our flight track within uh, 60 minutes. For, for NEO aircraft, we can't use that. We can't use extended range, which goes up to 120 minutes. So our international operation will be, we have to provide, a, a, let's say, a more uh, restricted route, which we are doing, and as soon as uh, EDTO, extended range operation, is allowed uh, and gets approval, we can then have all the flexibility. And uh, it is uh, for aircraft, uh, nearly aircraft abroad, it is, uh, it is allowed. So uh, we think that we will get this, um, this uh, extension, EDTO extension, in the next year or so. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mithen Latia from HDFC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, just wanted to understand the disconnect between the cash profits and the operating cash flow. So while uh, your free cash uh, has gone up by about 4,300 crores uh, on a one-year basis and, uh, you know, even... Uh, uh, I mean, you know, you suggested that there was an operating cash flow of 3,400 crores uh, in the first six months of this uh, financial year itself. Uh, when we look at the PNL, uh, uh, you know, there is hardly uh, 
uh, half of that is uh, cash profit. So uh, I, I just wanted to sort of uh, identify that one big item uh, which is causing this uh, disconnect between the payroll and the cash flow. And the cash flow statement has been given, but somehow it's not very apparent. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, let me let me try and walk you through that. I mean, our cash balance has increased during the half year, primarily driven by cash from operations, which are correct is uh, is, is 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 one big driver. Uh, our increase in deferred incentives that we get from our uh, from our vendors, an increase in our working capital. Our forward sales uh, have been, uh, you know, we were strong. Uh, in, in the as we looked at the end of uh, September, so those give us uh, uh, the large cash flow impact. Now that was partially offset by repayment of our lease liabilities, purchasing ground support equipment, and paying dividend for the quarter. But those are the key drivers. Uh, understood. Uh, and if I can sort of uh, understand the accounting impact of the FX fluctuation on lease liability. Uh, so right now uh, there is an INR depreciation, and you have passed it through the PNL, uh, and that because that amount is payable to uh, nobody, it just goes and increases your uh, lease liability on the balance sheet. Is that how it works? So, so basically, what happens is that you know, as per the new accounting rules, we are required to take a charge on a mark-to-market basis. Now, this is neither a payout to anybody, nor is it uh, um, uh, nor is it you know impacting any of our uh, metrics in any way. Because what happens eventually is that when you end up paying the bill, which is in foreign exchange, and either our lease liabilities or anything that you're paying, at that time we have a realized FX loss at that point. So in some ways it's just uh, showing you a notional number that had the currency been at this level, what would your liabilities be? And therefore, and the rules require us to run it through the PNL, and therefore it ends up as a charge to the PNL. So you're right, it is a non-cash item. Um, and uh, sort of because it's non-cash, would, does it also uh, increase the asset side commensurately, or how how does that work? No, it doesn't. It doesn't increase the. It doesn't uh, change the asset side at all. It, no, it basically no. hit on the PNL and increase in liability. Right. And how, liability. How, how how would it reverse itself? I mean, because it's not. Let's say the liability is not crystallized. Uh, how would it uh, reverse itself? So this is a period item, right? I mean, you 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 state your liability at the level at which the uh, rupee is at, is at that point in time. As you get to the next period, there will be a change upwards or downwards, and it'll again reflect it through the through the PNL. So you know, it'll, it'll keep on adjusting itself based on where the rupee ends at the end at, at the end of that quarter. I mean, you will settle it when you will settle it. I mean, when you are really due to make that payment, that's when you will truly settle it. Okay, so if I could sort of uh, put it other way, and I'm uh, just extending the same question, so not a fresh question. Uh, uh, effectively, uh, where uh, revenue and costs would have been matched un- under the earlier accounting, because uh, you know any FX depreciation would have been in some form or the other passed on to the customer. Here, effectively, that link is broken. The revenue and expense is no longer matched because even your future liability, you have sort of taken into your current expense. Right. You take it to your current expense, you route it through your through your liabilities, and then every quarter you adjust it. If you want a, a slightly detailed uh, you know, walkthrough on that, we can have that provided through Uncore. It's not a problem at all. Sure. Uh, great. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll come back into the queue. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Bob P from Samiksha Capital. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, so you know you you mentioned that you have uh, had difficulty obtaining some approvals and uh, i think it's common knowledge that uh, uh, spicejet has uh, gotten uh, a lot of important slots for mumbai delhi and some other important routes um, so there seems to be some uh, some sort of uh, irregular uh, approach uh, by the government in this whole matter um, you know, do you? Uh, I mean, how how do you plan to address that with the government? So uh, let me just clarify. When you, I think I mentioned that we were in a sort of a holding pattern for a while, while the government was sorting through how do we deal with this issue. So Jet had many foreign bilaterals, for example, 
who gets what. So the ministry spent some time deciding that. And while they were deciding that, we were on hold with one aircraft. So that's one issue. And the other issue that you're referring to is um, how was the final outcome? Uh, what were the sort of winners and losers in this? And uh, we can share with you a number. Overall, I'd say we did pretty well in uh, Delhi, while SpiceJet did better in Mumbai. And I'll ask Wolfgang to give you the exact slot counts, if, uh, if you would. Yeah. So if I uh, refer to um, the domestic slots, we got additional um, tw uh, 22 slots in 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 tiles, and we got additional slots for domestic in um, in Mumbai, which was less. Sorry, let me correct. 157, uh, 179 is uh, 22. So yes, yeah, 22 in, in 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 Delhi, and slightly less in in Mumbai. And uh, in, if you look at the absolute figures, basically what has happened, uh, SpiceJet and Indigo got the same amount in absolute figures, whereas our position was that we as a bigger carrier should have gotten a higher share, but it was done as it was done. It was a, a special uh, SOP which was uh, implemented, which gave Spice and uh, Indigo the same amount of, of additional slots in, in, uh, in these big, two big cities. And a similar thing has happened on the bilateral rights, where SpiceJet and Indigo got the same amount, approximately, of uh, freed up uh, uh, traffic rights because of the stop of operation of, um, of uh, Jet Airways. So we, do, we took it as, it as it is, but we, are, we believe that with our capacity coming in and our operational capabilities, we eventually will get uh, the, our, our fair share of these additional resources which are available going forward. Okay, and uh, you know, in, in the second quarter, you generated additional free cash for about, I guess, thousand crores. Now, uh, could you tell us in third quarter, knowing where the fares, you know, whatever you've seen till the this date in October, and knowing what you know about your costs, and assuming that you know those factors don't change, uh, and fuel prices don't change much. What can we expect in terms of free cash flow for third quarter? And I'm asking this question because there are very a large number of moving parts in this second quarter result. It's impossible to put head and tails together and you know kind of uh, figure out because your you know spread is uh, very negative yet you have good you know reasonable free cash flow generation. So how does one think about free cash in next quarter? So uh, let me tell you what we can forecast with some degree of confidence and what we can't. And um, so we. Know roughly that um, the market is softening. There's no question about that. Uh, we were on a pretty good growth path in terms of revenue, 5.7% this quarter. I think the quarter before that we did even better. As we've said in our remarks, we now think it will be flat. So there's some softening in the marketplace. We've told you that our maintenance costs will be roughly the same next quarter. Um, we think aircraft utilization will improve a little. That will help our task. Um, fuel, we don't really know. But beyond that, we also can't put all the numbers together and tell you, ha, huh, this is what the net net cash flow will be. That is going too far into the future, which none of us has the capability of forecasting that accurately. Uh, but it is, is it fair to say that some of this one-time one, one adjustment items that you had in second quarter, such as, for example, additional supplement rental and the whole re, you know, the change in accounting, that won't be there in third quarter vis-a-vis -vis second quarter? So then we are sort of back, back to more of the normal, uh, you know, the, the line items and change in those uh, uh, with respect. But to as, as we've said before, we do expect our maintenance cost to remain elevated uh, for the next two quarters. So we don't see a decline in our um, uh, maintenance cost. That continues, as we said, till 2022 when it goes down. Yes, but the uh, but you took one-time charge. Uh, uh, in your, you know, that led to an increase in supplement rental that's related to your future cost, uh, similar to the FX. You know, it's a future cash cost, but you have to, you know, obviously you booked it uh, in accounting in the P&L for a one-time basis. So that results in a, a, a significant deviation in the accounting number and the cash flow number. What I'm saying right. is that from first quarter to second quarter, such big deviation won't be there. Uh, because, uh, is, is that fair to say? So we will, you know, we will continue to, we'll continue to accrue these costs based on when do we need to send these uh, engines for, for shop visits? So the accrual will continue, but these engines will also then start visiting the shop as well. So the accrual will then get knocked off against the actual expense. So, you know, we will see the accrual build up 
and then we will see the engines going in, uh, you know, to the shop visit where this will effectively get, you know, knocked off from the accrual that we've created. Uh, it's a non-cash charge, you're right, but, you know, as and when these machines, uh, as and when these engines go uh, for the shop visit, you know, we will end up paying the MRO for the, for the, for the services provided. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Charles Cartledge from uh, Sloan Robinson. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, my first question is, in the last quarter, maybe the last two quarters, you talked about self-help improving your yields by about 5%. Could you update us on that? Um, and, and secondly, in the broader environment, um, you say the market's softening. I'd just like, like to understand that a bit better because the overall ASKs for India are in the low single digit, and one would have thought um, that you know, underlying demand might be such that we saw overall yields increase, but I'm, I'm sort of getting a different message. And if I may, the third point on your aircraft deliveries, I think earlier in the call you said that there were some delays. Is that, um, are these delays outside of your control then? Are they Airbus-type delays? And, and could you elaborate on that? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so first on the self-help issue, uh, we said earlier in the year that uh, we are doing certain things in network optimization, in our revenue management, sales initiatives, etc., which should give us a 5% boost in unit revenue over and above the industry trend. So basically we're saying we're stealing revenue share, if you will, over and above our capacity share. We see that continuing, and as you can see, this quarter again, we saw that 5% boost in unit revenue. We'll have to see how the industry does as the rest of the quarter unfolds. Uh, we are absolutely convinced that that will continue into the third quarter. So the question is, how is the industry going to do? No matter what the industry does, we'll do 5% better, we think. But the industry itself, we see the softening. And let me tell you that there was a little bit of a um, sort of tipping point, if you will, come this festive season and starting in September. So July, August were good, strong months. We were quite uh, confident of what was going on. September, we started seeing some weakening, and we thought, but wait, September is always weak. So it was difficult to sort of separate the seasonal weakness from any economic weakness. And now October, typically, is a very strong month. And you may not be familiar, there are two big Indian holidays in October. The first is called Dasera, the second is called Diwali. And generally, you don't see anyone coming out with sales during those periods because the demand is so strong. This October was unusual. In the middle of Dasera, the first festival, we had one of our competitors do a sale. And then again, now we're in the middle of Diwali, and a second competitor has done a sale. That says there is weakness. Otherwise, why would all these sales be coming up? And, of course, we are seeing it in our numbers as well. Um, but I'm not trying to be like, oh, my God, things are really bad. Things are softening is all I'm saying. So um, if, uh, if looking at our actuals and our forecast, uh, last quarter we had a 5.7% unit revenue improvement. Right now we are forecasting a flat unit revenue year over year. So that, those are the first two points. The third point, I think, was about aircraft deliveries. The aircraft deliveries delays are beyond our control. We are in no way uh, pushing back deliveries. If anything, we are hungry for more airplanes. There are a lot of routes we'd like to fly. And we are after Airbus and pounding the table, come on, come on, give us these planes. Um, unfortunately, I think you'll see this all across the aviation industry worldwide. There seems to be a problem with the, in the supply, supply chain, and people talk of castings and forgings, and those things are not available. So um, all engine manufacturers, all aircraft manufacturers seem to be struggling with keeping up with the demand. And, and so the aircraft deliveries are totally not of our own making. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sonal Gupta from UBS. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, so, uh, just uh, wanted to understand one, in, in terms of the uh, FX side, like uh, previously we've indicated that the restricted cash would be now, you're moving more and more towards dollar denominated. So, I just want to understand where would be that percentage? Uh. So, we are now 100% hedged for all our supplementary rent payments. So, you know, we don't carry any, uh, you know, mark to market exposure as it relates to supplementary rentals going forward. So, so all the restricted cash is now, uh, I mean, which relates to the rentals or lease payments is now dollar denominated? Yes, that's true, 100% of that. Okay, that's great. So, and, and uh, just on the um, uh, 
Uh, on the like uh, international operation versus domestic, I mean, like uh, clearly the uh, stage length would be much much higher. I think domestic maybe a thousand kilometers. I would, uh, on an average, the international would be maybe three x of that. So, could you just give us some sense in terms of the how does the yield versus cost metrics work, and I mean, what would be uh, some sort of a rule of thumb or equivalent number that we should uh, think about? Because obviously, a higher international will sort of depress yields a bit, but it it may be actually more profitable. So I just want to understand that. So look, uh, it, uh, there is, again, this seasonal uh, idiosyncrasies, if you will, that you have to deal with. Uh, so certain seasons, international is very strong, and the domestic is not as strong, and then it reverses itself again. And so net-net, when we look at it, um, we are very happy with our international growth. Really, we have put in, as I said, 100% growth in the ASKM, then you would have thought, oh, my God, this would really depress yield and profitability, and that has not happened. Um, and, and some of the sectors are actually very, very strong. Um, and I can point to Saudi Arabia, China. They surprised us with their strength. Um, obviously, at the same time, Hong Kong was weak. And as I said before, we started Vietnam with very little booking uh, availability, and we're waiting for that to play itself out. Overall, I'm guessing that over the, next, over the long haul, domestic and international will both continue to do equally well. And, and to the extent that some domestic flights are weak, we'll cancel them and move to international. And to the extent that some international flights are weak, we'll cancel them and move them to domestic. So we really don't see a big uh, demarcation between one versus the other. And, and the same thing uh, uh, sort of applies to all our six metros. You know, sometimes Chennai does better and sometimes uh, Delhi does better and we move capacity around. Uh, so there's no hard and fast like, oh, yeah, we know this is good and we know that it's bad. This all seem to have economic dynamics, seasonal dynamics, and move, we move the capacity around constantly. Hi, it's Willie Bolt here. Maybe I'll just add, uh, you were asking about the stage length effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and basically what you have to bear in mind is that, uh, yes, the yield per kilometer on a longer stage length will be lower, but equally the costs are too because for a number of reasons, but uh, one, operationally, you know, the aircraft is spending a longer time at cruising altitude as a proportion of the flight, and so, again, the fuel cost per ASK is less, uh, and there are a number, you know, the crew productivity is obviously better, and, and there's a number of reasons, but, you know, longer stage lengths, yes, they mean usually lower yield, but equally, they mean lower cost per ASK. Sure. No, so just on that, uh, that's what I was trying to understand. That is there a, like, if your stage, stage length is, I mean, like, domestic is roughly 900 or 1,000 and international is 3,000, uh, will that, uh, I mean, will that mean that even with a 10% yield, you would be equally profitable? Lesser, lower yield, would you be equally profitable? I mean, just, uh, is there a rule so, of thumb so there? Look, uh, they are very well established uh, charts of uh, revenue and cost by range, and we can share that with you. Um, I'll ask Uncle to reach out to you. And these are internationally available amongst all airlines. So, what happens at a short state length? What happens at a long state length? How does the yield curve and the I'm sorry, the revenue curve and the cost curve behave? And and they tend to go down in parallel, as Willie suggests. Net net, uh, the profitability wise, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Sure. So that will be very helpful. And just lastly, how much of the capacity is on metro routes on the domestic side? I mean, this uh, the, me the total metro to metro capacity is 24 to 25 percent of our total capacity for the quarter. For the quarter under review. The total, including international, or total Correct. just for domestic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Lokesh Garg from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, continuing an earlier discussion which we heard from your side that your plane deliveries are sort of coming down. We have also been observing that plane deliveries have come down to probably two to three planes per month. Uh, the question is, going at this rate of three planes per month, which seems to be a comment from your side, could we get to 25% also or would we undershoot that as well? So uh, really it depends on whether we catch up on the deliveries or <laughs> slow down further. So that's a bit of a moving target. Uh, as I've said also that we will also be increasing utilization a little bit. Not a lot, but slowly. Um, so between all that, I think it's around 25%. Uh, so it could be 22, 25. We're not as precise at this point, depending on how the deliveries shape up. So we're in constant touch with the manufacturers, of course, trying to urge them to send us more airplanes. I think also there's another effect, which is the 321s are coming in, 
and so that's uh, adding adding more capacity, even though the number of airframes is not as fast as, as we'd like, but uh, 321 obviously has about 40 more seats on it. Yeah. And uh, just sort of continuing that, we have particularly observed that 321 additions have specifically slowed down even more, and I think your commentary seems to suggest about nine 321 aircraft only so far. Uh, uh, do you face uh, even stronger constraint in 321 deliveries versus the 320 news? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, A321 might slow down because they are primarily pro or are produced in Hamburg, and Hamburg is the place where the industrial uh, issues are, where the, the, most of the, slow, the delays happen. Uh, but it's only a temporary thing. Uh, what we have, the forecast we have from Airbus, is it shows a, a catch-up within three to six months. Okay. My last question, probably, uh, there is a lot of discussion, particularly in the press, related to your uh, Europe offering starting someday, and uh, the news report seems to suggest that you sometimes take slots which you have not utilized on uh, uh, London sector. Uh, any outlook on that that you can share? Um, not at this point, no. Uh, as we said, I think earlier to a question, we are studying it. Uh, no definitive projections on dates yet. Okay, sure. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Deepa Krishnan from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, so, good evening. This is uh, Paul Kitt from Goldman. Um, so, re regarding international operations, clearly for the last uh, uh, six odd months, we've been adding capacity quite meaningfully there. Uh, but are we pretty much done with a large part of the short haul routes that we can address with our current fleet? And at what stage should we expect our international extension relatively slowing down? Assuming we don't really go the go the long haul, uh, so basically what we wanted to really understand is: is there more opportunities for us to really grow on the short haul international route after what we've done in the last six months? Yeah, there's there lots of opportunity. I mean, look, we fly to just two Chinese cities, and we fly to Vietnam from only one city. Uh, as, as you know, we have six metros we can fly from, and China, Vietnam, Middle East, Russia, all these are available to us, Africa. So we're not short of opportunities at all. If anything, it's timing in terms of aircraft deliveries, and of course bilaterals. Bilaterals are a big factor in all this. The government, uh, you know, China, we have seven more frequencies we can fly, and then we need to ha add to the bilaterals. Same thing in Vietnam and so forth. So bilaterals are a constraint, and aircraft deliveries are a constraint. Opportunities are not an issue. And if I may add here, uh, within the six-hour range of our aircraft, uh, on both sides, between Istanbul on one side and Hong Kong or Guangzhou on the other side, two-thirds of the world population is living. And they all, this, for six hours, our aircraft uh, and our business model works very well. And if you take this, you can, it shows you what, how much opportunity we have with our aircraft and with our business model here. Good point, sir. Thank you. That's it for my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Joshi from CGSCIMB. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask uh, what percentage of uh, tickets were sold in the 15-day bucket uh, during the quarter and what has been the trend right now? Yeah, um, yeah I, can, I can answer that. I mean, for the quarter under review, um, there was an improvement, uh, certainly in the domestic market, from 47% uh, sold within 15 days to 51% out of our load factor, um, whereas beyond 15 days went from 40% down to 36%. So domestically, and that helped obviously produce the yield uh, improvement that we saw of uh, almost 10%. And uh, what was the price behavior in this 15-day uh, window if we compare it uh, with Q2 and Q1 quarter? Sorry, what was the price? Is yeah, yeah, the... yeah. In, in, so it depends on, are you saying in a particular segment that you have in mind or just system-wide? Uh, just in total, uh, domestic. So our yields are up by 9%, right? Yeah. So, I mean, isn't that the answer? Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, can you uh, uh, comment on, uh, like, uh, is the, uh, you are saying that the um, uh, uh, market in terms of price is softening. So, is it just the domestic market or we are uh, facing the same issue in the international? Uh, no, it, it, it's mostly the domestic that we're seeing the impact. 
And again, it is, like I said in my opening remarks, it's, it's a big, a lot of it is focused on the metro to metro. As you know, a lot of new capacity came in those markets that jet, jet vacated, and that's where we're seeing the biggest pressure because there's new new capacity coming in which has not yet found its footing, if you will, and that's where we're seeing the major softening. And uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, shares uh, we are having right now in the 15 days bucket window in the current quarter? Uh, I don't think we I, – I can't share that, I think. Okay. I mean, it's tough to get that number, frankly. I mean, we'd have to know every competitor's 15-day bucket sales, and we don't. Okay. And uh, lastly, uh, we, uh, as you said that uh, uh, from next year onwards, there would be slower growth uh, in the number of fleets that we would be adding. So uh, can we also uh, – uh, is there any possibility that you maybe uh, start replacing a, uh, your CEO fleet with NEO fleet? No, if we got planes faster, we would. The issue is in the supply side, right? So the reason we are not growing fast enough is because we're not getting the uh, airplanes fast enough from Airbus. So, yes, if we got them faster, we would be replacing the CEOs faster. And uh, what, to, what rate uh, would you target to replace it? Any uh, goal on that? I really, we don't have those numbers. So okay. If and when we get more aircraft deliveries, we'll have to see whether we can, we should be adding capacity or replacing. Okay. Thank you. That's all from me. Thank you. The next question is from the lineup, Deepika Mundra from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, so just a following up on the maintenance expenses again. Um, the one-time charge that you have taken, uh, is it also because you are expecting the CEOs to stay longer in the fleet now versus earlier? Um, and just to re-clarify, so it's 0 0.6 per ASK for the quarter, and uh, you're expecting this 0.6 to continue for the next couple of quarters uh, as well. Um, so we are, uh, to your first question, no, we are not planning to extend the leases on the CEOs. The CEOs, as we said, start going out on 21, and by 22, they're pretty much gone. We have sort of upgraded our, or re-estimated, if you will, our actual experience with the CEOs, and we said we need to take our accruals up based on what we're seeing. That's all we've done, and by 21, end of 21, we should be out of this problem. And the 0.6 uh, question, I, I, I didn't get it. Can you come, come again on that? Uh, sorry, so just some confusion because uh, on whether that 3 billion rupees is a one-time charge or not. So um, if you look at it on a per ASK basis, it's 0 0.63 for the quarter. Um, so what I want to understand is that w w this same level continues, right, p of 0 0.6 per ASK for the next two or three quarters, depending on how uh, you taper down the maintenance expenses. You know, I, I think you should look at this as an overall bucket of, okay. of, uh, of our supplementary rental and lease costs. We expect that bucket to remain in that range for the next two quarters. Uh, you know, this is this is defined by the uh, engines going on uh, on shop visits. is defined, you know, the uh, you know cycle that's running in in a, in a particular month in a particular quarter. It's very difficult to estimate, uh, you know, engine by engine for the overall fleet what it means. The guidance that you should use is that on a supplementary rent. Uh, bucket overall, the number should remain in that range. So, um, most importantly, I don't think you should use the ratio because this is not engine cost spread over all airplanes. The NEOs don't have this problem. So, if we add more NEOs, it doesn't mean our uh, engine maintenance costs go up. Engine maintenance costs on the CEO is a fixed pool, and that's the number that we are using, and that's what you should use. If we add more NEOs in, in our growth plan, it doesn't mean our engine maintenance cost goes up proportionately to the 0.63 that you're mentioning. Got it. Um, and also, I think sometime next year, uh, this may or may not happen, but the max planes are expected to come back into the system. Uh, given that the kind of softness that you're seeing, do you expect that uh, it could continue well into next year if the uh, ban on the 737 max is lifted? So the softness is an economic issue, and your crystal ball is as good as mine. Um, are we in a softening economic environment? Um, looks like it, looking at the um, Diwali experience. Uh, when will this stop? Next year, will the economy get stronger? Uh, I think you have a better economic forecast than I am on that issue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last question. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ankur Goyal for closing comments. 
Thank you all for joining us. I hope you found it useful and hope to speak to with you again. Thank you.